everyone from Russian scientists to Chinese to Korean to American to European. I will say one thing that I think is really profound, which it is, it, this is the first time in a very long time that I've seen so many people share a unified voice about optimism, about an abundant future, optimism about a big breakthrough, rather than get on social media to share a voice about fear and anger at someone or something, and to hear everyone around the world get together and be excited about the potential of this discovery and its applications. It's really profound to see, and it's really amazing and wonderful to see. Now, where we are, a bunch of labs took the described chemical structure of this material, LK99, which has lead and phosphorus, oxygen, and some copper in it, and put it into these modeling systems, these computer modeling systems, to try and understand where do the electrons flow, where do the electrons sit in this material, if this material is made the way it's described. And um, five different labs have now published papers that show that the way that this material is supposedly produced, it should create these pathways or these energy states with the electrons that theoretically could enable superconductivity at a very high temperature. And so that's an, um, a very confirmatory signal that computer modeling of the electron clouds, because remember electrons, even though they move around the nucleus of an atom, we only kind of have a probability statement of where they are. So if you look at all the probability statements of all the uh, atoms stuck together and you try and figure out what's the aggregate probability of where electrons are, it indicates that there are these pathways that theoretically could allow for electrons to move freely through the material and be completely void of any sort of resistance, which is superconductivity. And, and, and so that's what's really profound uh, about the modeling outputs from five very separate independent labs. Just so we're clear, when electricity normally moves down an electric wire or in computers and CPUs, GPUs, whatever, there's resistance, that resistance results in loss, it results in heat. And the only way we've been able to reduce that loss is by making it freezing cold, like significantly cold. Totally right. Yeah. So, so electrons now, if we were to do this, when we didn't have to make a cold, that means that these superconducting experiments move from the laboratory where it's forced to be cold to the real world our desktop, you used an analogy in chat that uh, was really interesting of like a superconducting road where and, and then you don't lose energy right now, how much energy do we lose transporting right. it to our houses? Right. So, you know, I would say on the order of 70% of energy we produce is lost to heat and friction. Think about okay. moving a car down the road, when you move a car down the road, you're having to put energy in to overcome the friction of the car hitting the road. So if the car could hover above the road, the friction goes away and the energy needed to move the car goes way, way down. When you build a data center, the electrons that are moving through the copper and the semiconductors bump into other atoms. When they bump into the atoms in the material, they shake those atoms. When atoms shake, that is heat. So that's why copper wire heats up when you put electricity through it. You're moving electrons through it. Some of those electrons bump into the copper atoms, shakes the copper atoms, they get hot, and then some of the electrons make their way through. The rate at which electrons are bumping into other atoms is the resistance of the material. So, um, and so, so plainly, all this energy is going into yeah. cooling down data centers and all this energy is lost in computing uh, to heat. And uh, same in, in electric motors could be reinvented, semiconductors, uh, uh, integrated circuits would be reinvented. And like I said, if you had enough of this material, you could put it in roads. And because superconductors also reflect magnetic fields, you could put magnets on the bottom of cars and float them above the, the ground and cruise around without any friction. And so if there's any all these amazing of this is true, this 70% loss of, and then all this energy put into cooling data centers, we could be looking at doubling or tripling the amount of energy available because we've built a certain amount of energy infrastructure. So this would be all gains if we could figure out how to yeah, but, leverage this yeah. technology. Massive would gains and massive abundance. It would lower the cost of electricity by 10%, 100%. I mean, look, assuming huge infrastructure investments, which would take probably decades to do. Sure. You would you would get there. But in the near term, there are these incredible applications. Quantum computers are built using little superconductors as the qubit. And so the superconductor holds the qubit state. So this idea that we could now have room temperature quantum computing is also game a very changer. profound one, game yeah. changer, low cost. And, and the first thing that would be changed is likely electronic components. So we would take electronic components and redesign them using superconducting material that would allow you to reduce heat loss and energy loss. And that would have a big transformative effect on, for example, 
the big effort right now to make more AI chips, GPU chips to do matrix transformations. There is some precedent for this. People are now creating optical bridges between GPUs and CPUs in order to reduce the heat. So they're using optics, basically light to transfer Fiber optic data. interconnects. Yeah, yeah, that's been the big lift right now from what I understand in GPUs and data centers is but you just still have to convert the data. Yeah, yeah it's it, th I mean, we could go on for hours on that. But like, yes, I mean, this would just be a game changer in electronic component, right? Photonic chips, right? Yeah, photonic chips. But look, this this is obviously a little bit separate. But here's where we are. So LK99, there's all these simulation models that show this thing could work. But there's two, two things I will say came out of this from some of the simulations. The first is remember, this is a crystal with mostly lead atoms. And these lead atoms, some of them get replaced by copper. And when, when they get replaced by copper, it causes the crystal structure to change by 0.46 degrees, is what the Koreans say. The angle changes by 0.46 degrees. And when that happens, that bending causes the electrons in all the atoms in the crystal to overlap slightly. And that overlapping effect causes this free flowing electron tunnel. Uh, that, that, mm. theoret that is the theory for why the superconducts. Now, what the simulation showed is that you have to replace only one of the lead atoms not any of the other ones in order for this to work. And that could explain why everyone's having different results in the lab trying to reproduce this. Ah. Because when you bake this stuff in an oven, if the copper gets into the wrong atom space in the crystal, it doesn't work. And so that's why some of these things might end up looking good and some of them don't look good. And some of them, there was a lab yesterday in China that published no resistance, but they had to cool it down to 100 degrees below freezing. And so it wasn't at room temperature, but it did superconduct. It did have no resistance. 170 Kelvin, I think is where they got it. Yeah, so 100, 100 below zero so Celsius. So in other words, so, there is yeah. a key. There is a key here in the molecular structure that you have to just thread perfectly. The order. Right, you have to replace the right yeah. lead atom with the copper in order for this to work. And so that's a technically very... And, and what happened, by so the way... So that's a fidelity oh, issue. That's a tool issue. Like you have to have the right tool to do it. Or is it luck or... Right now. So, so, so here's the crazy story. And I'll tell you guys this, I don't know how real this is. But the guys claim, so remember, these two scientists, Lee and Kim, hmm. supposedly saw this material in a lab in 1999. That's why it's called LK, Lee and Kim 99. And so in 99, they came across this and they could not replicate it. And they had no idea how to make it again. And it disappeared and they didn't have the sample again. They then spent the next 20 years of their life one was a college professor and the other one worked for LG for, as a battery engineer. And they just had these random normal everyday lives. It reminds me of Dennis Quaid in the movie The Rookie, where he had like this amazing arm and he was going to go to the MLB. And then something happened and he spent the rest of his life as a high school PE teacher. And then 20 years later, he gets his arm back and he goes to the MLB and he plays in a, in a major league baseball game. Because all of a sudden, in, during COVID, these guys got some funding. They set up a company. They went into a lab and they rediscovered this material. And mm. apparently, this is the rumor, I don't know if this is real, the rumor is they had it, in, they were baking it in an oven in a vacuum sealed tube. And when the guy took it out of the oven, he accidentally bumped into a table and the tube cracked. And when the tube cracked, it did something to the material. And then they measured it and oh my God, it's room temperature superconductor. That's the, the current theory of what, the rumor of what happened is a video. That's like Peter Parker being bitten by a radioactive spider. I mean, <laughs> totally. it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but, yeah. So here's the drama. This guy, Quan, got inserted to oversee them as like their CTO. The guy that gave the money to Q-Center said, he's got to oversee you. Quan apparently got fired from his job in March and he was kicked out of this company, was no longer affiliated. And the rumor is that Quan took all the lab data and these guys in 2020 during COVID, they discovered this. They started filing patents and working on the manufacturing process, trying to figure out how to replicate it and do it again. So they had all this data, but they weren't going to publish it. They didn't want the world to know about it yet. And then all of a sudden, Quan gathers all this data, probably disgruntled after getting fired, puts it into a paper and puts it on the Internet. So that's the first this paper that came out. Because yeah. there is a website called R A R X I V. Is, is there a yes. pronunciation for this website? So this is where you can open source file scientific papers, right? Okay, so this is a place for dropping papers outside the of the, the like traditional academia? journal. Yeah, the, the traditional journal process requires peer review. And there's yeah. editors at the journal that decide whether or not to publish your paper. So sometimes gatekeepers, it, yeah, gatekeepers. And so if you don't want to do that, you just want to get a story out to the world right away. So during COVID, everyone was publishing on the site, well, all their updates on research they were doing to help the world figure out what's going on with COVID. So it's a great place to just hit the world with your data, hit the world with your findings.